Hi, this is Ben with Novalock Stereophonic, and the focus of today's video is the beautiful Fisher 800B stereo receiver. This unit was produced in the early 1960s. It uses 7591 output tubes for roughly 25 watts per channel into 8 ohms. And it's defined by this beautiful dual dial, FM and AM, shown independently with two magic eyes. This is a, a pretty unique uh, setup in the Fisher line of products. It also has an interesting historical context as it bridged the gap between two competing forms of stereo broadcast that existed at the time. So in addition to discussing that, I'm going to do a thorough review of the front panel controls, the rear panel, and we're also going to take a look inside of this unit at the restoration that was done to it. So if that sounds interesting, stick around. Let's begin with some historical context. So the 800B kind of sat in the middle of a range of products from uh, from Fisher that were produced from the very late 1950s to the to the mid 1960s. The TA800 tuner amplifier 800 was the predecessor to the 800B that was produced roughly 1959 to 61. Uh, it had a more obscure tube complement and did not have built-in FM multiplex. So it had an AM and an FM tuner in it, but it didn't offer onboard stereo decoding. It did feature the dual dial, but instead of side-by-side, -side, it was over-under, and it did also have the magic eyes. The 800B is kind of the more refined version of the TA-800. It was produced from the late 1960s to 1962. It has a built-in FM multiplex module so that it can internally decode and reproduce stereo broadcasts from FM. Um, and the, the dial is arranged in this left-right configuration, which gives this really uh, aesthetically pleasing symmetry to the entire unit. For this model, Fisher switched to a more conventional tube complement. It uses a lot of 12AX7 and some tubes that are considered you know, more mainstream in the, in the tuner sections. The Fisher 800B was strategically positioned between two competing forms of stereo broadcast that were available at the time. The comparison that I like to make here is back in the day when HD discs became available, there was a competition between HD DVD and Blu-ray. Or if you wanted to go back even further, VHS versus beta. You have two competing forms of media and the manufacturers don't know yet what the market is going to embrace in the long term. So in the case of HD DVD and Blu-ray, certain manufacturers built combination units that could play both forms of media. This allowed them to kind of bridge the gap and continue selling product and make the consumer comfortable until the kind of the battle uh, came to an end and one of the two formats won out. So the, the 800B is very similar to that in the way that it is presented for receiving stereo signals. So FM multiplex is what eventually won out for many reasons. Um, but a lot of people don't know about the other form that was available at the time, which is what we see here, FM AM stereo. So the idea back in the day was FM mono exists, AM mono exists. Why don't we broadcast one channel on FM and the other channel on AM? And this was a great idea. The, the, the hardware already existed and all it meant was that the manufacturer would have to build boxes that had an FM tuner and an AM tuner in them. Uh, but the downsides really outweighed the upsides. So think about it from the broadcast side. The station would have to have AM and FM transmitters and you know, be, be broadcasting this content maybe different times of day. They would switch to mono AM, then have certain times of day with stereo broadcast, combining their FM and AM transmitters. It was just complex on the, on the broadcasting side of things. And then on the receiving side, everything has to be doubled. You can't share a dial string and a, and a tuning gang for AM, FM. So that means more expensive metal parts on the inside, a higher tube count, nothing, nothing can be shared. So um, added complexity in the build. And, you know, noise uh, and reception range, everything was different between AM and FM. So it, it, it wasn't really the, the greatest solution. FM multiplex with the way that the 19 kilohertz pilot works and the, the L plus R, L minus R, it was an ingenious system and, and it obviously won out. That's what we still use today. So um, that's a little bit about the uh, FM AM stereo multiplex battle. I'm sure there's tons of more info out there, but in the, the context of this video, that's all we need to get into. By 1963, FM multiplex was 
the clear winner. Uh, Fisher really had no reason to produce this type of unit anymore as FMAM stereo went the way of the dinosaur. So the next rev of this was the 800C that was produced from around 1963 to 68. And the 800C with that, we saw the return of a combination AM FM dial on one dial string. The magic eyes were eliminated. So on an 800C, we have a signal strength meter here and a stereo beam indicator. Um, there's also a military version of the 800C called the 1800, which is basically the same receiver except it has a multi-voltage transformer so that it can be used in different parts of the world. And then one more model worth mentioning is the 800T, which is not part of these three, the TA-800, 800B, and 800C. The 800T is a military version of the 500TX, which was a transistor-based receiver. All right, let's get into the front panel controls and the operation of this unit. Looking at the front panel of the 800B, the first thing I wanna focus on is the uh, tuning knobs. So we've got FM here and AM here. On a conventional receiver, you would just have a single dial, usually on the right side, or single tuning knob on the right side, and the FM and the AM would be shared on a single dial for the whole dial face. What that means is, if you're listening to AM, for example, and then you switch to FM and tune in your FM station, if you go back to AM, you have to retune your AM station. One of the advantages of having a dual design like this is you can you can have an AM preset, basically, where you can leave your AM tuner always tuned into the station that you like, and then listen to your FM at will, and then you would just flip uh, here at the indicator or at the the source selector. So the right now I've got AM there on one station. If I go to MPX stereo, I've got a stereo music broadcast there. If we switch to the FM AM stereo selection here, FM is going to come out of the left and AM out of the right. So that's what this sounds like. And if we do select mono, your, your AM station and your FM station are mixed together, same out of both speakers. So a weird use case for this, I don't recommend this, but what you could do is say, for example, find an FM classical station and then put a talk radio station on AM and have yourself a little bit of both. The, the main reason to have a receiver like this is not that weird ability to do that, but rather the AM section is built really, really nice in these because they wanted to get the best fidelity um, on two methods that aren't really that compatible. So the AM tuner design is actually really good in this unit. So let's go through a bit of the tuning. So I'm gonna go back to AM. So as we tune on and off station, you can see that the magic eye will close. Graduated from USC, right? Use the yeah. If we go back to FM multiplex, do the same thing in the FM band. And if we go to FM mono, you can see that the eye opens up a little bit. I think that's why they call this the stereo beam here. So as we're switching from stereo to mono, you can see that the stereo brings in the eye a little bit closer. The rest of the controls on this unit are pretty straightforward. We have our volume control here. We've got balance uh, for left and right uh, compensation. The loudness control here, when loudness is on, that applies a, a curve to make this sound more flat at lower listening levels. So if you're listening really quiet late at night, the bass is going to sound a little bit more full if you've got the loudness on. Um, let's go over to this side. So here we have our bass and treble controls, and these are concentric. So if you wanted more bass, you would rotate this. But if, say, the left speaker was in a corner, you could compensate by backing one off slightly. So that's what those concentric controls for treble and bass are for. If we activate the high filter, this is going to apply a curve to the EQ that will just limit some of the high frequency. Uh, same thing for the low filter here. Channel reverse, what this does is it just flips your left and right channel at the preamp level. And then Where's our phase? So we have a, a phase reverse switch here. We talked about this a little bit already. When this switch is activated, it basically flips the positive and negative of one of the two speakers to, to change the, the overall phase of the system. Uh, and then sharp versus broad. Uh, sharp is for better selectivity when dealing with closely adjacent stations, but the broad mode would give us the best fidelity. The MPX filter 
is not what a conventional MPX filter nowadays is. Uh, usually if you see an MPX filter on a modern tuner, it will be for 19 kilohertz pilot tone suppression. But on a, on a vintage Fisher MPX filter is almost like a high blend. It takes some of the high frequency information from both channels and combines it to mono to minimize uh, hiss and noise. So that's what the MPX filter selection does. Uh, tape monitor is pretty self-explanatory. This allows you to um, to monitor the input from the tape deck and that'll override whatever you have selected here. Uh, we have our auxiliary for line level listening and then uh, phono over here if you need the RIAA EQ curve on the source media. The tape head is um, reserved for those vintage tape decks that actually need an outboard preamplifier. Uh, if you were listening to a regular conventional tape deck, you'd be on the tape input over here. So that's about it for the front panel. Let's spin this thing around and take a look at the back. This is what the 800B looks like from the back. Start out in the upper left with the AM loop stick antenna. So in the manual, they recommend that this be put in the downward position for normal operation. Uh, the upward position is for shipping only. And you can see with these 7591s here, this is gonna get extremely hot back here and that's bad news for the AM antenna. So definitely make sure that's down uh, during normal operation. You can see I have replaced these clips here. The original ones had turned yellow and cracked and the antenna was basically just free floating on its wires in there. So definitely signs of heat uh, in that specific situation. If you wanted to run an external AM antenna, you'd remove this jumper here, which disconnects the loop, and uh, you could run a, a long wire from, from this terminal here. This section here is your speaker output. So the right side is pretty self-explanatory. We would just hook our black or, ground, or uh, negative wire to the ground terminal here, red or positive, sorry, to one of these three taps, 4, 8, or 16. So if you had an 8 ohm speaker, you would connect the black to the ground and the red to the 8. The left channel is a little bit different. You use these two jacks here, you see this says left speaker. You do black on the ground connection and red over here, and then select your impedance with this little uh, terminal here, depending on your speaker impedance. And the reason that's done is so that the phase reverse switch on the front works. And what that phase switch does is it basically just flips your red and black wires at that socket so that um, you can compensate for an incorrectly recorded program or something like that. We also have a center channel output jack here. This does not have any power on it. This is a signal connection. So if you wanted to hook up a third amplifier and run a center channel speaker, this is where you would connect um, to get the signal. There's some inputs over here. Aux is going to be line level, but phono and tape head are low level inputs, meaning they have extra amplification. So this tape head input is not for a normal tape deck. That would be for an older tape deck that requires additional amplification for the head to work. The phono here applies the RIAA curve to the signal, and we can compensate uh, with a trimmer here to adjust the level of the phono compared to the aux, for example. This is our tape loop here. So we have a tape monitor where you would plug in a tape deck and then um, what does this say? Recorder out. So that'd be your tape output jack. This section here is a loop that's labeled reverb. This is for something called a K10 space expander, which was a tube reverb that Fisher supplied. So that was an uh, additional accessory you could purchase to add kind of an ambiance to the signal. And in that case, you would unplug these jumpers, hook the space expander in that loop. But when you're not using it, these clips need to be in place. Next up, we have a uh, remote control jack. It says control plug. This is basically a nine pin tube plug that ha that's had some connection shorted. So if we look at this, this is just a regular um, nine pin socket. And then a couple of the connections have been jumped here. I'm going to be doing a separate video on this. Um, you know, a way to add remote control to a vintage receiver like this. Uh, so we'll go into that in more detail in another video. We've got our power cord here, and this has, you know, it's kind of cool. This still has the original Fisher label on it from the factory. We've got our FM antenna connections here. We have local, LOC, and, and distant. This is uh, to fine tune your antenna so that when you're listening to strong local stations, you don't overload the front end of the receiver. And then distant would be a little bit more of a signal that you can dump into that front end to try to try to get as clean of a signal as possible. With FM, it's a little bit more noisy, so it's important to get a, a signal into the front end at a correct level. And then of course, we just have a couple uh, convenience jacks back here. So that's, uh, that's it for the rear panel. Let's take a look inside this thing.
This is what the 800B looks like when it's pulled out of the wood cabinet. These were originally designed to get permanently installed in furniture or consoles or inside of one of those wood cabinets, so there's really not a need for a metal, a metal case in the standalone version. Stereo equipment back then was, I guess, seen to be always inside of wood for some reason. Now, there's not a lot of the restoration that we can see looking at this angle aside from the capacitor replacement. So these are custom capacitors made by Hayseed Hamfest. I really like using them. They do a great job. So this is what the original insulated capacitor would have looked like. So it's a really good match to that. And then the other ones, they're not that high polished chrome that I get with the Hayseeds, but they're you know very close in, in the form factor. So they do, again, a really good job with these. So the, the extra chrome on the hayseed caps really adds to the bling in here along with the, the chrome getter flashes on the tubes. So the other thing to look at from this angle is the tube complement. So out here, of course, we have the output tubes. These are 5791s from Tung Sol. This is a modern production. We'll go a little bit more into that when we look at the bottom. These are the output transformers. So each one of these transformers pairs up with a pair of output tubes working in push-pull. This is the phase inverter for the uh, line stage, so each one of these tubes basically is sending a signal out to the output stage in equal and opposite. So those are very important tubes there. This is our line stage, one for each channel, and our phono stage, one for each channel, and these ones are shielded. I did need to replace one of these tube sockets. The socket had failed and I couldn't recover it, so I did have to put a new socket in one of those positions. These tubes have to be of a very specific um, grade in order to work properly in this circuit. Fisher used a lot of uh, Telefunken and Mullard tubes of very high quality and their circuits were designed around those vacuum tubes. If you put anything besides a high GM balanced tube in this position, it's going to have issues. There's a circuit out there, I think it's called the, uh, the new circuit that a few guys have come up with which helps to you, where you can put any 12AX7 in here, but if you're gonna run it in a stock configuration, a, a set of balanced uh, high mutual conductance telefunkins is the best bet. So what I did in mine, uh, I didn't really wanna modify that circuit. I did some other modifications uh, like the IBAM board, which we'll see in a minute. But on this one, I left this part of the circuit stock. And what I did, this is a long smooth plate telefunken. Th this, this one had all telefunken 12AX7s fitted into it. And the line stage and the phono stage run on DC from the power supply, and it's down at around 22 volts. So the, the filaments are a lot less stressed out, and these are not doing as much heavy lifting as the phase inverter stage. So what I did was I found my best two telefunkins that, that tested, you know, really high output and, and good channel balance, and I installed those in this section. I got really good performance out of this output stage by doing that. I fitted a pair of JJ12AX7s into this position, and these I think are some new old stock, uh, was it Sylvania's maybe? Uh, Raytheon. These are the Magic Eye tubes. And when I got this thing, the magic eyes weren't centered centered in the um, the display window, so I had to tweak them a little bit. You definitely want to um, kind of make the adjustment while it's powered off because there's high voltage at this section. So if your tubes are misaligned a little bit, I recommend turning it on, figuring how much you need to go one direction or the other, and adjust it while it's turned off so that you don't end up with a risk of shocking yourself. All the rest of these tubes in here are for the AM and FM tuners, and note that we have two separate uh, tuning gangs. Because this tuner has independent AM and FM, each one gets its own uh, tuning gang. Most of the time they are, they are shared on one dial string. And then there's tubes for each of those. And then this section back here is the FM multiplex. This allows our stereo uh, broadcast to be received. So that's about it for the top panel. Let's uh, flip this thing over and take a look at uh, the restoration that was done by looking at the bottom. All right, so there's there's a lot going on in here, but the the quality of the parts that Fisher used makes it so that there's not a whole lot that needs to get replaced in these when they get uh, restored. So they use pretty good quality resistors. A lot of the capacitors are are film, um, so they 
the main thing that needs to get done in these is usually a power supply rebuild and especially the bias supply. So we saw the, the capacitors on the top, the hayseed hand fest caps, those are located in these four positions. So that was completely redone. I really like using those caps because they can give me the exact um, same pin configuration as the original one. So I can copy the power supply exactly as it was originally installed. And then I will use new resistors, either, either completely new ones or I'll use new old stock carbon composition if I have the correct uh, values on hand. So the rectifier diodes have been changed there. I've added an inrush current limiter. We've got some XY safety caps in here. Um, and then this section here is the negative bias supply. This is pretty important. So the original <coughs> rectifier is one of these Siemens um, selenium packages. So inside of this is a selenium rectifier and uh, these can fail pretty badly when they do and if you lose negative bias your output stage is basically going to self-destruct. So this is like a must on a Fisher restoration is to rebuild the negative bias supply. There's originally a capacitor clip installed in this area here which holds um, one of these capacitors here for the negative supply. This is 2-in-1, 1000 microfarad 35 volt. But you can see the, the pressure on this with this clamp really smashes this capacitor. It's got, uh, got big dents in it. Um, this, this section did not test very well. Some of the other caps tested okay, um, the multi-sections from this section, but that uh, negative bias capacitor is not in good shape. So there's a few different ways that you can go about doing this. You can get a hayseed cap like this, or you could put a couple capacitors inside of the original clip. But what I opted to do was use the two mounting points. So this selenium has two uh, mounting points that connect on the side of the chassis here. So what I did is I installed a modern bridge rectifier in, in its position to take over the function of that selenium rectifier. And then I used the other hole with a standoff and a terminal strip to mount all of the negative bias supply components. The selenium rectifier uh, has a much higher voltage drop than a silicon rectifier and it's usually advisable to put in a, a compensating resistor or some other method to bring the voltage down so that it matches the original specification. So remember when I talked about moving phonostage tubes into the uh, phase inverter positions up here? The reason that that was possible is because by default, this supply ran at about negative 22, negative 23 volts. So it ran the, uh, when you put two 12AX7s in series, their filaments, it ran them a little bit lower and they tend to last a little bit longer. So I wanted to continue that. So what I did is I put in a compensating resistor here. So even with my silicon rectifier, I'm still at the original negative uh, voltage that's used to supply the filaments for those tubes. The other function of this supply is to, to give negative grid bias to the output section. So that's in the original design that's a fixed value and it uses a voltage divider, sends the same voltage to all four output tubes and it's set at an optimal level that should work uh, with most 50, uh, 5791s. Now the problem is this circuit was designed for you know old production tubes and the ones that are available nowadays they don't hold up uh, quite as well in this specific circuit. So there's a few modifications that need to happen if you want to run modern like tongue soles or something in, in this type of device. So the first thing that I've done here is added screen grid resistors so that there's a little bit of a, um, a loading on the screen connection. I've also added a uh, a sense resistor down here for for measuring the bias and it's a quarter watt type and it has two purposes if one of these tubes runs away and starts drawing heavy current it will blow up that quarter watt resistor but it also gives us a reference where we can measure the the bias of the individual output tube this board here is a modif modification called an ibam ibam individual bias adjustment uh, modification and what this does is it allows me to feed the negative voltage from my negative power supply into this board and then adjust each one of these trimmers for each tube and set its bias individually. So we'll go over the bias setting at the bench and how that board works. I had to replace the value um, of these filter capacitors to work along with this circuit. And then I think the only other replacements in here were these two little guys. I had a, a failed tube socket here and one of these capacitors was also acting a little bit wonky so I replaced both of those. And then uh, there's a couple, you know, little electrolytics uh, spotted around in here. But I was surprised at how well this thing tests with 
all these original resistors and stuff. It just goes to show that tube circuits are a little bit more forgiving um, on, on value drift in certain areas, and this thing is testing really, really well. So that's what we'll do next. We'll throw this thing up on the bench. I'll demonstrate a bias adjustment using this IBAM board, and we'll uh, see what the waveforms look like on the scope. I've got the 800B up on the bench with a couple uh, measurement points going here. Before I move forward, I do have to um, warn you guys, if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. There's high voltage in here. If you don't know what you're doing, you could damage your amplifier, you could get injured yourself. So don't um, attempt anything like this unless you're qualified to do so and are comfortable with the risk. On the right hand meter, I have uh, the B plus or the plate voltage to the vacuum tubes here. So we're about 400 volts here. And this is the voltage drop across one of my cathode sense resistors on the output. So this is how we're going to measure and adjust the bias. I have my Variac set to around 123 volts. That's about the average for me here in New York City. Sometimes it goes up. So I'm gonna set at the lower end of the range. It's recommended for the 7591 in this circuit to be biased about 30, 30 to 35 milliamps so I'm gonna err on the low side and if my voltage my mains voltage increases it'll go up a little bit but it's not going to take it outside of that recommended range so each one of these resistors that I've put in here are quarter watt tied from the cathode to ground that means we can put the meteor me, uh, meter anywhere on the on the chassis and then we just need to measure on the tube socket and we'll get the voltage drop from cathode to ground on each one of these tubes so on this first one I'm measuring 0.304 volts or 304 millivolts. If we divide that by the 8 ohm, sorry, the 10 ohm resistor, that gives us 30 milliamps. So we just need to move the decimal place over one and that gives us our reading in milliamps. That's why those 10 ohm ones are often used. So each one of these adjustments corresponds to the tube in that order. So if I wanna change the bias on this tube, I just come to this uh, trimmer here and rotate it until I get to where I want. Now this should be done after the amplifier is warmed up for a while and stabilized. And then after you make the adjustments, you wanna go back and check because they sometimes do affect one another. So I'm gonna jump to the next tube here. That one I've got dialed in pretty good. That's looking good. I had already set this a couple weeks ago, so it's probably almost right where it needs to be. That one, that's a little under. Let's bring that up. Come on. And what we're actually doing here is adjusting the negative voltage to the grid of each tube. So if I put the meter here, I change this back into volts mode. Come on. That is our negative grid voltage coming from the power supply. It comes into this board a little bit high and then these uh, trimmers adjust the voltage down. So as I'm rotating this control, I'm increasing and decreasing the negative voltage. The higher the negative voltage, the less current the tube draws. So if I raise this way up, if we come back here, our bias measurement will have dropped quite a bit. Take this back up to 300. Again, equivalent of 30 milliamps of cathode current. And double check again. 300, 303, 300. So I can tweak this one out a little bit. It's very touchy though, so I don't know how much more accurate I'm going to get. There we go. So that's the bias adjustment on this thing. And there's one other thing I wanted to go over while we're in here, and that is the negative supply voltage. So let me get this meter out of the way. And I'm gonna take this one over from measuring plate voltage to measuring the backside of this dropping resistor. So we're running this at negative 22 volts. If I didn't put the dropping resistor in, I would be running 
negative 25.63 volts to the uh, to the filaments of the 12AX7s. So again, this is just to improve the longevity and that's the way that this circuit originally ran. So we're gonna keep it original and go with that. So that's the bias adjustment and everything there. Next, we're gonna do a quick uh, power test. We'll look at how these waveforms look on the scope. Let's take a look at the performance of this amplifier. So right now I'm feeding in a one kilohertz sine wave and I'm just gonna raise the volume control. And a lot of times on these fishers, these volume controls are terrible, but I'm really lucky on this one. Look at how smooth that tracking is. Usually one channel will go down and then the next one will come up and it'll just be really wonky, but this one has a really nice operation through its whole range. So as we get up here, we'll hit clipping. So we're clipping there. If I back it down uh, to where both channels are clean, I'm reading about 13 and a half, 14 volts RMS. Let's call it 14 volts. So if I take 14 times 14 and divide it by eight, about 24.5 watts per channel. Now the specs for this thing says it's a 65 watt receiver, but I think what they were doing back in the day is fudging the numbers a little bit. So if we take this to one channel and we just take one into clipping, I can get a little bit more power out of it. So right now that's at, let's see, I'm gonna check my distortion here. I'm about 0.9% distortion. Let me take this, let's, let's call it 1% 1, 1 and see, take the measurement there. So I'm right around 1% distortion and I'm measuring 15.7 volts. 15. 0.7 times 15.7, 246.49 divided by eight, about 30, 31 watts. So if we add those together, now we're starting to get to that specification. So I think that's what they were doing is really just fudging the numbers or working off of peak voltages instead of RMS. So realistically, this is you know about that little over 20 watts per channel. Um, let's take a look at some of the other parameters. So I'm gonna take it, let's change this a little bit so that we can look in a little bit more detail. I'm just gonna get these centered on this line here. So both channels are equal and in between those two lines, I'm just gonna show uh, the frequency response here a little bit. So as I decrease from one kilohertz, it stays nice and flat. Right now we're at 200 hertz. Let me take it down to 70, still flat at 40. And by the time we get down to 20 hertz, it's starting to come down a little bit, but not much. Let's go back up to 1K. And some of this dip, I think, happens because of the interconnect cables I'm using. So we'll do a square wave test in a bit. So this is starting to dip around 12 kilohertz, but overall pretty flat. So let's take a look at a one kilohertz square. That's actually pretty darn flat. That's looking really nice for a tube amplifier. So overall, this thing's got some pretty good performance for a 1960s tube amp. And uh, you know, the controls are really good. Oh, why don't we do a, we can do a test of the, the equalizer section. So if I take the, the treble control, we can see how it changes the shape of this waveform. Same thing with bass. And then we have our loudness curve as well. Let's activate loudness. Oh, there's a high filter, low filter. Where's our loudness? There's loudness and watch, it becomes more pronounced at lower levels and the effect of the loudness control goes away as we raise the control. That's because it's tapped in one of the lower range, uh, ranges of that volume control. So again, overall very nice performing amplifier. And uh, that about wraps it up for the video. So thanks again for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed this content. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more and we'll catch you next time.